The uh, program today, uh, I've got Lee Fisher, and I think we're doing an, an inter interview of Bob. So, Bob Biggs, do you want to take over from here? I sure will. And this is actually not going to be a recorded uh, session. This is going to be a live session. So, number one, would appreciate it if everybody could mute their uh, computers uh, so we don't have distractions as I'm asking Bob questions and he's responding to them and so forth. Uh, we will get into, or going to get learn a lot about Bob and his background and so forth, but we are going to also ask him about, uh, as our incoming president this uh, coming July, uh, what goals he has for the Oxford Rotary Club. So he'll be speaking about what's going to happen this next year, 21-22, while he is our president. So, Bob, are you ready? Yes. Okay, here we go. First question is, tell us where you were born and what was your family life like growing up and how many siblings do you have? I was born in Washington, D.C., but grew up in uh, a suburb, Chevy Chase, Maryland, just about a mile outside of the district line. And uh, I think my family was really uh, out of the middle of the middle class, although uh, both my parents had PhDs. My sister has a PhD, my wife has a PhD, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I have one sister who's three and a half years older than I am. And uh, I'll show you a couple pictures later on, but it was a very pleasant uh, place to grow up and being so close to Washington. As kids, we got to tour the White House, the FBI, the Smithsonian. So uh, it, it was very pleasant, basically, upbringing. And then when I was uh, 16, family moved to uh, the Cleveland area and I finished high school at Shaker Heights High School. Um, that's the first time I ever was really face to face with black people. So that was a new experience. So, you know, Bob mentioned that his parents were PhDs and of course his wife is a PhD and he is as well, as you'll find out more about later. So that's what we call a paradox. Yes, paradox. That's, that's a joke, right. everyone. That's Bob's joke. Paradox. An old joke. Oh, okay. Oh, right. uh, oh, okay. Here we go. All right, moving on. Describe your uh, current family uh, status, spouse, kids, where and what are they doing? Still married, incredibly, after 40 plus years. And uh, the kids are grown. And, and also, uh, amazingly enough, uh, both of them, my daughter, Lara, my son, Alexander, are living in Oxford. That's a long story. My daughter uh, now is running the Oxford Coffee Company and my son, uh, is an assistant professor doing very well with publishing at the University of Cincinnati. So it's really in the medium-sized miracle category that they are, are both here and we see them a lot, actually get along with them. The coffee business runs well as long as I do exactly what Laura tells me to do. Good for you. Uh, tell us about your educational career, uh, where and what uh, you majored in. So yeah, uh, again, I graduated from high school uh, <clears throat> in Shaker Heights, Ohio. So the two public school systems that I went to in Maryland and Shaker Heights were both excellent. And then I was an undergrad at uh, Northwestern, um, had several majors before I finally graduated with a BA in history, and then uh, goofed around for a couple years and then went uh, and got my doctorate at the University of Michigan that is the big one, Ann Arbor, uh, in modern Russian history. Okay. And uh, you also mentioned to me earlier that you spent some time in Russia. Is that right? Oh, yeah. No, uh, I've spent maybe two and a half to three years of my life in, in the Soviet Union and, and then Russia and Ukraine. Uh, first went in uh, 19... 87, 88 for uh, research on my PhD dissertation and spent a whole academic year there. And then back in, um, oh, I'm sorry, the first one was 78, 79, and then back again for another academic year in 87, 88 to work on another research project. And uh, I haven't been back for a while, but I used to go back regularly in the, in the 90s and uh, the early aughts. So I'll go again sometime, sure. Okay. Tell us about your first job as a child or young adult, and what was your first job uh, out of college, and describe that experience. Out of college, gee, uh, I really, I, I goofed around as a kind of a handyman in Evanston, Illinois for a while, and then I worked as a fry cook in a Greek-owned restaurant, 
um, before I finally got into graduate school. And then out of graduate school, I had visiting assistant professorships at great places, University of Vermont, University of California, San Diego, and finally a tenure track job at the University of Texas at El Paso. And then my wife and I both got tenure track jobs here, miraculously again, uh, starting in 1988. Okay, so describe a little bit more about uh, your current or former profession and what, what brought you to it? Well, I never, I never thought when I started undergraduate school that history would be a logical or usable major, but I used to read a lot of history as a quasi nerd as a kid. So uh, I kind of drifted into it. But the big thing at that time, is I, was, I started um, Northwestern in the fall of 1967 and along came the Vietnam War and the assassinations of 1968 and the Tet Offensive. And, and uh, it just seemed like uh, a time to try to study something about communism. What, is, what the heck is communism? What are we fighting? And that led me back to Russian history and the study of the Russian language. So uh, I can't claim a lot of originality, but at least I, I stuck with it long enough to, to make it useful and usable. So why the interest in the coffee shop and the coffee industry? What, why, why have that interest? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I like, I like, <laughs> I like good coffee. And I, along about 2002, something like that, I decided to to teach something that had immediate global significance. Coffee is connected to climate change, social justice, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere relations, uh, all sorts of research on plants to try to stay ahead of global warming and so on. Um, tourism, which uh, is ter was terribly important. And, and then from there I decided, well, I should, try to get my hands dirty and deal with the community in a different way. So I thought, well, I'll get into coffee roasting. And then I suckered myself further into opening a coffee shop and it's still there. So, so that's, that's the story of that. Okay. Uh, let's uh, shift gears to Rotary now. And uh, you know, what, what would you like uh, for Oxford Rotarians to know about you that might surprise some of us? I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm I, I, I'm an okay guy, I guess. You know, and and it, <laughs> it seemed that uh, there wasn't anybody else uh, jumping forward to be the next president. Uh, but I do have some ideas of what what I would like us to do. I would like us to get reconnected, and this is this would be down the line, I think. But reconnect with international projects uh, and uh, see about bringing some foreign students here. I would like to try to increase the diversity of the club membership. I mean, I think we're doing well. We're down a number of members point a few years ago. Uh, I don't know whether that's a problem. I mean, we seem to have stability of membership now, but adding a few more people uh, would, would probably be a good idea. Uh, I've been in a, on a lot of meetings just lately of uh, clubs club presidents and so on in our district. And, and we're, we're doing quite well compared to a lot of clubs. So the, I, don't, I don't have radical ideas for change. I think Dan's done a great job. And uh, most of all, I'd like to see us get back together uh, in person. And I, I think that that will happen um, relatively soon. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to hear about your reconnecting at the Rotary International level, especially with that project uh, called Group Study Exchange, where we've had Bob Miller and Co. Potter serve as team leaders to take Rotarians from our district abroad somewhere, let's provided yeah. we can travel in the future, and yeah. then also hosting us, uh, the local Oxford Rotary Club, hosting a team of professionals from a foreign country that would come in here. And yeah. uh, glad to sure. hear about uh, that kind of... Uh, understanding about uh, the world and different cultures and so forth. So okay. it's good to hear that. What, what motivated you to join Rotary? Well, to be, to be frank about it, I thought it might help the coffee business, but it also uh, seemed to me that I would be getting into a group of people who were uh, really capable and active and important in the Oxford community. So uh, why not try to get in with such people uh, the creme de la creme of Oxford, Ohio. So for those reasons, it seemed to me 
a good idea to join up. And, and the fact that uh, we were having our meetings right next door to your coffee shop, that uh, was a plus too. Yeah, but I often actually came from my house, Bob, you know, a further five minutes away. So I had to make that kind of sacrifice. Okay. So what have been some of the highlights uh, you've experienced uh, in the Rotary Club? Uh, we know you're president-elect and you will be our next president. Uh, any committee or experiences that kind of stand out in your mind about the Oxford Rotary Club? Well, it, it's been remarkable to see the flag project and, and to see the way that everybody has pitched in and, and really helped with that. Uh, that's, that's been great. And, and I, I, I just have enjoyed conversations with people at La Rosa's back in the day. So, uh, and then being on the board uh, and, and now having some kind of connection, whatever it is with people in the district, uh, I've learned a lot already that way. And, and uh, I understand better how valuable Rotary can be in its communities. So that's all been good. Have you already attended the uh, president-elect training seminar pets uh, for incoming presidents for here in Ohio and so forth? Or is that done virtually this year? Yes, virtually, right. And, and some of that has been, uh, again, very uh, enlightening and, and even fun once in a while. So yeah, I've been in on those and, and I'm being trained uh, even as we speak, probably. You know. Good, good. Well, how long have you been in Oxford now uh, and connected to the city? How long? Since 1988. Okay. So I've lived here much longer than any other place in my life. Uh, do you want to tell us about any other, your, any other of your other community or professional engagements, activities during your lifetime? Well, uh, I was on the Oxford Civil Service Commission, which was fascinating in terms especially of what the, uh, the police were doing right and, and wrong. And, uh, and the, the city attorney and the, the city functions very well, uh, partly, frankly, because it, it can fire people from time to time who are not doing their jobs, which Miami University doesn't seem to be able to do anyway. Uh, and then on, I was on the board of the uh, Three Valley Trust for a number of years, so I got to know something about land conservation, and that's a great organization that has put, uh, well, last time I checked was years ago, 22,000 acres in Butler and Preble and so on uh, under conservation easements to prevent that land from being developed to keep it as forest riparian or uh, farmland. So those are my major efforts to try to do something for the community. Okay, uh, one final question before we open it up to the Rotary Club members here. Uh, any other goals as the incoming president that you might wanna share with us uh, when you take over for Dan in July? Uh, I don't know about that. Um, you know, I just, uh, uh, I just would like to see things run, uh, whoops. Smoothly, sorry, I've got a few pictures here and now I'm screwing up completely. Uh, we'll go back to this. Uh, no, I mean, the, the goals I mentioned before are, uh, are the ones that, can everybody see that by the way? Can yeah. you see my screen? Yeah, yes, okay. yes, uh, yes. No, I, I, you know, these other, these other club presidents talk about need for change and I'm thinking, First of all, I'm not, I'm not really all that sociable, not antisocial, but second, uh, I don't see the need for great change in our club. I mean, we have, we have, again, a good deal of stability. We could always use more younger members, more women, and then people of other uh, races. Uh, so I've been working on the side on that. I haven't made a whole lot of progress yet, but I'd like to see that happen just because I think our country needs that in a big way and that's happening uh, so far and wide today. So that, that's pretty much it, Bob, what I want for the- Do you wanna, do you wanna now share some more slides before we get in some questions from the Rotarians? What, you don't like my first slide? No. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, do you wanna so talk was, about it? Yeah, this was Chevy Chase, Maryland. And again, I put Mighty White, there were just no no black kids in my school. No, it was, the suburb was completely segregated. That's all changed. Uh, here I am, Austria, 1970, with my Norton motorcycle. Really got around a lot that year. Got into Eastern Europe, Istanbul, 
here's some Turkish soldiers who demanded that I stand with them so they could take their picture with me. Uh, whoops, go back. Let's see. Oh, there's my kids. I forgot how to go back. Uh, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, previous, we'll go back. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, nuts. We'll just go back quickly. Um, previous. There we go. Uh, anyway, this is, I was at the Livadia Palace in the Crimea a few years ago. This is the palace where the big three, Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill met in 1945 to carve up Europe. So this is one of my fairly numerous trips to, uh, th this Crimea was then in Ukraine. Now it's part of Russia. Laugh a, a minute, you know. These are my kids long time ago when we first, uh, well, this is about 94, something like that. It's my son, Alexander, my daughter, Lara, in more recent times. This is actually my wife there, Gretchen, a few years ago. Uh, this, this is just a few places I've been. China, this was an anti-smoking poster in China, although everybody lights up in China all the time, so I don't think it's done much. This is a valley in Western China that uh, I just thought was a nice scene. In Colombia, coffee tasting uh, can be a lot of fun. So uh, you can see we're having a good time. And this is in Colombia, the initial stages where the coffee cherries are picked. And the first thing they do is just dump them on a screen so they can sort the twigs and stuff out. This is Ethiopia just on my way to a research station in west, the western part of the country. And here is in the town of Jima, and you can see that they've grabbed old Coca-Cola signs and so on for shade on their horse-drawn carts. So, uh, and there's just a few places I've been, the Alhambra, uh, the Moorish Palace in Spain, uh, Alsace, part of France today, the area that Germany and France fought over for so long. The ossuary, the bone dump at Verdun, one of the most depressing and ugly buildings ever with the bones of a, maybe 100,000 soldiers all mixed together from World War I. Uh, then these are my books uh, that I've done. And this one where it just has the text is what's uh, forthcoming at the end of this year or the start of uh, next year. Got a lot, certain amount of more work to do on that. So that's it. Now, now, Lee, Lee have a question? Is he there? Does anybody have a question? Yeah, yeah Bob, Bob, I, yeah, this is Lee. I do have yeah. a question. Okay. Give us, okay. uh, and, and give me a, a little background be, be behind your lynching book. Oh. And how, and how that happened and whether that was an idea that you had been thinking about for a while, uh, explain that. Yeah, okay. I, I was a historian of Russia and I sometimes describe myself as a recovering historian of Russia. Uh, and so I, I did a couple of books on, on 20th century Russian and Soviet history and, and with a German put together a book of articles on World War II. And then I thought, I'm starting to see, I was starting to, notice all kinds of similarities between the Soviet, what's usually called the Great Terror, mass arrests of 1937-38, and the witch hunts, very quick rise and fall of the number of arrests and so on, the use of torture. So I wrote a book about the witch hunts. And then I noticed something of the same pattern in American lynching, where in the 1880s, you have a very steep rise to 1892, and then a pretty steep fall after that. So by 1912, only about 30% of the black people were lynched who were lynched in 1892. So this began to intrigue me. Why, why do these curves look somewhat uh, similar, although the settings are so different and, uh, and the curves are over, the time period of the curve can be quite different. So I thought, well, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll try to write a book about lynching. And I wanted to write something about American history a little bit more too. So. I chose one of the least happy topics ever, but I thought it needed to be explored in, in more uh, depth and especially to explain the decline of lynching at a time when Jim Crow was still so powerful, racism was still so strong, that is after 1892 and up into the 1930s, just a really sharp drop in the number. So that's how that happened. I, I'm sort of an intellectual gypsy at this point.
Yeah, that was a conversation stopper for sure. That's really great. Yeah. Bob? Yeah. We met in the 1809 Club. You were a very professional historian. And I remember that uh, we both had books reviewed in the New York Times Book Review at the same time. Uh, one time, and we had an 1809 Club meeting in which we talked about uh, our books, which were very, very different. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, are you still, are you writing about coffee now or are you writing about Russian history? Neither. I, Neither. And the, the, the page of, uh, I'll try to put that back up again. The, the, uh, the last page, this page, uh, this book, the forthcoming book, which should be out at the end of this year or early next year, this is the full title of it. So yet another direction for what that may be worth. But the, the topic, the studying the body has a lot to do with race, gender, sexuality, concepts of civilization and all that. So it's, this was the age of uh, the first bodybuilder, a professional bodybuilder, the first female sex symbol, Buffalo Bill, all that. So, so I'm going in a different direction, Bill. Can you have I certainly ranged around, Bob. I, I, uh, I admire your versatility. Uh, well, it's either that or outright foolishness, you know. To no, I, I mean, I knew you as a Russian historian, and you were a serious historian. You've become yeah. a lot of other things now, and your coffee, I think, is very good. It's been a great boon to the community. Now you're delivering it uh, very, very well. You're keeping the the uh, company going when you can't. you you can't open your coffee shop anymore, can you? No, not well. It, we, I mean, we, we could in theory, but we couldn't put more than about six people in the store at a time. And yeah. uh, we're, we're enjoying not having to get up at 530 in the morning. And uh, it's been it's been fun to uh, actually my daughter's doing, you know, 99% of the work, really. And uh, but roasting is what we always wanted to do in the first place. So to roast coffee and to try to get it to to taste really good and and to get it out to people quickly, that's, that's been more fun than retail. Uh, you know, 99.99% .99 of retail customers are great. Then there's always that one that comes in with an attitude and sticks in your mind. So I don't miss that in a, in a big way, I must say. I, I congratulate you for changing uh, professions so easily. And uh, having been a Russian history expert, you became a, an expert in coffee. Uh, I think that's a remarkable uh, transition, but you've been successful in both, I think. Yeah, and next year I'm going to be a cowboy and see how that works. Uh, no, really? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I th I'm thinking about retiring one of these days, but I, I don't know. That, that doesn't sound like so much fun. Retiring isn't bad. I recommend it. Oh, but, okay. But okay. You've, got, you've got lots to do. Yeah, I've got always got something to do. <laughs> hey, Bob, this is Lisa. Yeah. Uh, two, two questions for you. One, uh, what street or landmark did you live close to in Chevy Chase? Uh, I lived just a block, half a block off Connecticut Avenue near East West Highway. Do you know that area? Um, I don't, but I have a mutual friend that um, grew up about a mile from Chevy Chase. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at that point, by the way, Chevy Chase was not considered super cool. At, at this point, it's one of the most desirable places in that whole area to live. And the house that we sold for, I think it was all of 50,000 bucks in 1965 would undoubtedly be worth a million five hundred thousand or something today. So that's what's happened in the DC area. If, yeah. you're, a, if you're only a mile out, outside of the district line, you are in prime real estate, huh. but we didn't, you know, we didn't have that kind of uh, foreseeing ability. So. Right, right. So my second question, more importantly, is uh, once we get out of uh, the pandemic, do you foresee um, arranging any trips, uh, coffee trips to Costa Rica or anywhere else uh, like you have done in the past? I'd, I would love to do that again. And, and, and by the way, if we could, uh, I, I just need enough suckers. I mean, uh, participants. And uh, 
we had a lot of fun. And I think uh, in uh, Costa Rica and gee, when was that? 2018. Yeah. And we got to see some stuff that people just don't ordinarily see in that country by going to coffee farms and talking to the farmers and, and the managers and so on. So I would like to do that again. I was even thinking maybe somehow that could be combined with um, a trip to do, to work on water purification, something like that. Um, because Lord knows that's still a very, very pressing issue in the back country of any country you want, even Costa Rica, but especially El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras. That's a, that's a very powerful issue. So sure, I'd be up for that. As long Great. as I can still walk around on the farm, sure. <laughs> Thanks. So oh, thank you. Any other questions for Bob? Hey, Bob, give us a sentence or two in Russian. What do you want to say? I can say it on the whole day in Russian music. In the past, I had a, a, a lot of uh, times, you know, a week, two months, when I would only speak Russian. So I occasionally still dream in Russian. Not nightmares, no, not at all. But I have to say, I, I really enjoyed my time in, in Russia and the Soviet Union. And people think the Russians just, I don't know, they're just purely evil. No, they're, they're people, they, they have a wicked sense of humor. And I wanna brag about one thing. I have had a, a number of meetings where somebody brought out Comrade Pepper Vodka, a bottle of Pepper Vodka. Uh, and one, there's a Russian and Ukrainian custom. Once you open a bottle of liquor, you never reclose it, you finish it. And so actually a couple of times, seriously, I was the last one standing and I was able to find the door and go home. But please never again, no more Comrade Pepper Vodka for me. It was okay, well, well I was a little younger. No, no. So yeah, I had a great time in Russia. Any other questions? I don't Bob, have a question. I'm oh, sorry, Rosemary. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment that when I was a freshman at Miami, I took Russian Ooh. because I thought my father spoke Russian. And I struggled for the first semester. I still remember Niponimayo Nichevo, Strasbuche, Kakvi Pozhivayache, and selected uh, terms not of endearment that I call my spouse when he said, Durak <laughs> Nakolyosa. No, no, yeah, you're not, then you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's my two cents worth. Uh, so. And she'll throw in 50 happy dollars for that. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> well, we can, Rosemary, we can, we can work on, uh, I would like a beer, please, and things uh, like that. So, yeah, so you yeah. have something useful when you get back. <laughs> And, right. and I don't know, I, yeah, I only know four or five words in Ukrainian, but we can try for, for pivo, for beer that way too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> any other questions or comments? Well, Bob, what an interesting guy you are. I thought that before this and now even more so. And uh, everybody let's thank Bob for his appearance today. Russians always be, clap for themselves. I don't know if you know that. But. Yeah, you should. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll be putting a book in Lane Public Library in honor of your talk today. Thanks for stepping <laughs> to the plate. Uh, this is, uh, and uh, Bob Biggs and Randy Pratt, thanks for this idea. Uh, it, it really adds a dimension to our club, and uh, I think we all appreciate it. And again, it's all Lee Fisher's idea. We, okay, just, Lee, I want to say thank thanks you. a lot to Lee and, and Bob. This this was fun to do. So, okay. Um,